In this episode, a lowly bi bicycle mechanic, they were his words, not mine, made the profound statement that I was proven to be wrong, and for that I must wholeheartedly apologise, which involved my removable of bearings by some carefully calibrated hammering rather than using one of these, which is a blind bearing puller. Now, as a member of the professional engineering community, I joined the ranks of Elon Musk and SpaceX, who had the rapid, unscheduled, involuntary disassembly of whatever it was via a rectum. Who else got it wrong? Well, there's me and a few other people. We've got these brands, um, so NTN, SKF, a few of them you would have heard of, and the person on the right, who is a chap called Reginald Scott, and he got it right, and he posted a video uh, with this handsome chap uh, in the thumbnail. These are the uh, companies that you know you can go and have a look at um, from the service manuals showing them hammering. So here we've got Zip, uh, Hope, that one's DT Swiss, and that one's SKF. So in that regard, I'm an illustrious company. To give you some context, this is about the hugely exciting topic of removing bearings from a bicycle hub. It's about as exciting as the cycling industry gets in 2023. Um, and I had immense fun reading the comments, so I've had to just put my hand up in the air and say I screwed up. This is um, an exploded view of a Windspace hub. I've just put this on here because it was good to show, it was a good representation. And this consists of a series of bearings, uh, preload collars and all that kind of stuff. The one that we're interested in, or the style that we're interested in, is here. So the two bearings and uh, the tube in between. Now that tube exists to prevent excessive preload and that distance along its axis, so from here to here, defines the preload and basically it's a very controlled length. And typically it's to 50 microns, so 0.05 millimeters. So my alleged error, or error, is apparently I use the wrong tool to remove the bearings and the technique I employ which all of the aforementioned companies on the previous slide are guilty of, is wrong. We'll just touch it up slightly, uh, just to make sure that it's not going anywhere. So you get one spanner on the bottom there, and then uh, one spanner on the top. It's quite tricky doing this, trying to work out where the camera is. There we go. So I just, just a way to remove a bearing. Okay, there's no shock involved control. Like if anything goes wrong, you can stop and you can back it off. So I've drawn a schematic of what is going on in the scenario you've just seen. So on the right hand side is what you would get in a typical setup. So this, this one here. Uh, on the left hand side, I've drawn a diagram of what Reginald claims he has in his setup. Um, the only real difference is this chamfer here. Um, going through the things in turn, the tube, so this thing is typically aluminium, sometimes it can be steel, um, but it's very soft. It's, um, you know, hardness of 100 on the uh, Vickers scale. This radius here on the bearing is typically 0.2 to 0.3 millimetres. That is the same thickness as two sheets of paper. Um, the bearing is also very hard. It's typically, you know, 1000 HV. Um, I've just you know, that's an arbitrary number. It could be harder than that. Uh, and another thing is the bearing is typically radiused and not chamfered as shown. This is the NSK book. Uh, if you pick a, for example, 6802 bearing, so it's a 15 millimeter bore bearing, um, 0.3 millimeter radius. This is the NTN bearing catalog. Um, again, same 6802 bearing, 0.3 millimeter radius. Now, when you put the bearing puller in, um, it will usually engage around the radius of the bearing, which is here. If you recall in Reginald's video, he tightened it um, with a spanner. Now, if I tighten the same thing by hand, um, it will be enough to distort the aluminium. Um, remember, you know, the material is basically the same as a Coke can, albeit it's a bit thicker gauge. Um, and what happens in that regard is you end up with preferential damage to the the spacer because it's soft. 
um, and it often ends up flared. So this is exaggerated, but you can, you can see what's happening there. The net result is you end up with a chewed or messed up end and the bearing clearances are usually 15 to 20 microns, so they are quite small. Now, if there is a na now a slightly larger gap than there was, the bearing life will be diminished because you've, you've, you've clamped it up and it's moved further than it's supposed to. Um, but, you know, that's, that's one thing. Another thing is if you flare it too much, and this is basically a schematic, you can end up touching the seal. All in all, you'll end up basically with, you could possibly end up with more lateral flex. So as you turn the bike in, it, uh, the, the wheel deflects more. Now the method shown in that Reginald video, it requires a bearing with a large radius, basically an enduro style bearing. You also need a preload tube with a chamfer and, and most aren't, so here's one here. Um, it's deburred, but it's essentially flat. Um, there's three photos here. Um, I appreciate what I've done on the first two is you can quite clearly see the chamfer on this one here um it's you know it's it appears to have been machined and not ground um, because you can see the lines in the middle you've got an ntn bearing um obviously i'm showing you the outside is just for photographic purposes uh you, you know you can quite clearly see it's, it's radius um and it makes the bearing stiffer and it's actually you know from a stress concentration perspective a radius is is slightly better on the right you've got um a wheel bearing which I've done the blind bearing puller up a quarter turn past um, you know locked up with a couple of spanners and you can see how much that sticks out um, hence the damage to the spacer this is a screenshot from the video from Reginald's video the spacer was described as completely undamaged if you look at the screenshot it looks as though the end is flared you can see the light reflection here. So if you follow this line, um, it ticks up here. Um, and here's a, uh, another shot further down um, showing the same tick. Now, if you compare that to the, the bit at the other end, you can quite clearly see uh, the difference. Furthermore, this spacer is quite thin gauge. Um, now it looks like the tube to the eye, I mean to my eye, doesn't look to be round at all. Um, so where the blue arrow is pointing, you can see that. And there also appears to be jaw marks there and there. Um, that top one may be slightly over to the left. So why do most do it incorrectly? Well, it's to avoid damage to that spacer. Most people reuse the spacer, it's a critical component and the bearings are just generally regarded as a, a, a component that wears out. So, you know, you just get rid of it. Um, and the blind bearing puller will not work on the majority of wheels because of the radii and the spacer chamfers and all that kind of stuff. And I don't think that came across in the, uh, the video. Um, yeah. And the other thing I would state, and it's a statement, if you reuse bearings where you've pulled through the rolling elements you would be putting pits into the raceways and it is generally well it's regarded as very poor practice um, in a professional context if you do it on a piece of machinery that was fairly critical uh, that would be regarded as negligent that's it if you've got any questions or comments bang them in the box below